Hello, everyone, and welcome to Influx Days Virtual. My name is Al Sargent. I'm with the product team here at Influx Data. And today, my colleague Shashi Reina and I are going to be talking to you about how to build modern monitoring with InfluxDB and AWS. What we're going to cover, uh, Shashi will cover monitoring AWS best practices. And then I'll go ahead and talk about how you can monitor AWS with InfluxDB, talk about how you can configure Telegraph to monitor AWS, and then show you a demonstration. So with that, let me go ahead and hand it off to Shashi. Hey, thanks, Al. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shashi Reina. Um, I'm the Partner Solution Architect with AWS. And I'm going to get started uh, with best practices for monitoring on AWS. We'll cover like a general uh, monitoring practices and also um, some little bit of cloud work before I hand it back to Al. So monitoring involves uh, processing logs um, and metrics uh, to provide insights into your application and infrastructure performance and health uh, so that you can keep uh, your application running smoothly. The best practice and key aspect of operation excellence, which focuses on how to optimal run systems. Operation excellence is one of the pillars of the AWS well architected framework. The framework emphasizes the importance of monitoring for automatic changes, such as scaling, responding to events such as service disruptions, and implementing standards for managing daily operations. So what, why we do like monitoring? We do it to gain insights. Um, are my customers getting a good experience? Uh, customers simply have no patience for slow, erratic, or buggy applications. And monitoring is a key to, to ensure that your app and infrastructure is delivering the right experience to the customers that are using it. How are my application changes impacting overall performance? Any changes that I'm pushing to customers in form of new features or functionality, what is the impact on the cost and performance, for example? Do I need to scale my app based on the customer traffic trends? So while troubleshooting application, we first need to understand where the problem occurs. What are the steps uh, in the application workflow that are causing us to lose online customer engagement, for example? How do I learn about such problems in future that have negative impact on customer experience and also proactively fix them? Uh, so good monitoring a plan um, contains five key elements. Um, there's people, these can be the users of the applications, your vendors or customers, uh, what metrics impact them. Uh, we need to figure those things out. Or these could be your operation people who will have a different matrix than the vendors or customers you have. The knowledge of the system uh, and how it is made up is also important to be part of the monitoring plan. Uh, what, for example, what is the application stack like? What is the infrastructure that the stack is running on? What is the storage layer? Understanding the different layers that make up the application help us to include them in monitoring plan and track them. Uh, alerts, how do you derive them? How do you trigger them? Um, tying them back to who they need to go to and how that drives your insights. We'll talk about some best practices around these in the next slide. <clears throat> then you come up to the tool part. Now, how do you decide on a tool? Um, and the best practices around that is that you first find what your needs are and then you find the tool versus the other way around. Um, you may plan to leverage existing capabilities and native capabilities of cloud platform. For example, you can use CloudWatch, which gives you alarms, dashboards, and logs, and, and you have paid for the license after all, so why not use it? Um, a cloud for, uh, the CloudWatch fact, Amazon CloudWatch monitors more than one quadrillion or thousand trillion metric observations, triggers more than 3.9 trillion events, and ingests more than 100 petabytes of logs per month. And this is this status is uh, as of February 2019. And if you find that the the out of box uh, tools don't uh, do it for you, then there's a marketplace offerings from our partners, uh, and you can go there and find the right tool which works for you. The last piece and the most important piece is the action. Uh, if an alarm condition is triggered or alert is fired, what action is to be done? What kind of automation? or run books you, you're going to run after that. It could be something like scaling out the application, or it could be like spinning a new stack in a different availability zone, et cetera. So here are, here are some other best practices on your alerts. Um, 
Monting will not be built in a day. So use your plan as a, as a roadmap and, and keep it up to date. Craft in batches, starting with the most critical to determine the health of your key, vote, uh, key workload. Refine quickly and aggressively before moving into the next batch. This keeps noise level small and build trust in the system. Alerts should always prompt an action. If they do not, revise the alert or eliminate them entirely. Never keep an alert in operation that contributes noise. Choose the right alert. For example, if the user is uh, experiencing, a uh, user experience is being impacted by latency, then you should be you know, capturing the latency matrix, not the CPU user's matrix, for example. AD operation, operation staff. Think of what things are most relevant for the operation people to lessen the time to act on the alerts. Time spent in the beginning will save a, a time every time the alert fires. Email orders based on time received are not severity. So it does not remove expired alerts. So email is useful in some cases, but do not use it as your sole mechanism or system of record. Let's talk about CloudWatch, uh, um, Amazon CloudWatch. Um, it is a monitoring service for AWS cloud resources and the applications you run on AWS and on-prem. You can use Amazon CloudWatch to collect and track metrics, collect and monitor log, files, set alarms, and automatically react to changes in your AWS resources. Amazon CloudWatch can monitor AWS resources such as Amazon EC2 instances, Amazon Dynamic DB tables, and Amazon RDS DB instances, etc., as well as custom matrix generated by your applications and services, and any log files your applications generate. You can use Amazon CloudWatch to gain system-wide visibility into resource utilization, application performance, and operational health. You can use these insights to keep, to react and keep your application infrastructure and operations running smoothly. At a high level, the cloud which allows you to spot trends, centralized monitoring, troubleshoot and triage issues, create matrix on logs to evaluate behavior, uh, take action based on whatever your action workflow is like, and also have an operation status view through different dashboards, which are very customized based on each users. So at AWS and Amazon in general, metrics is equal to visibility. And we collect a lot of metrics, and this all gets stored in CloudWatch. But where do, you, where do users even get started when they log into the CloudWatch console? We internally face the same challenge. Where do I get started on monitoring? That very quickly enables me to get an overall view of health and status of all my AWS resources matrix under my account. To even get to operation monitoring, first you have to understand what all is in your environment. What instances belong to which of your various apps? Do I have the right metrics enabled? Then I have to research best practices on how and what metrics to monitor. So then I log into the console or use a cloud formation script to auto-generate dashboards when resources are instantiated. But there are all these other gotchas, like which statistic do I use to monitor for which metric? and which graph visualization is the right one to help me best understand the health and performance of my infrastructure resources. Not all statistics are created equally. For example, for the same metric, if you are monitoring EBS read ops, the average statistics paints a very different picture than the sum of the statistics. So you have to be very picky about how do you want to move forward with monitoring statistics. And also not graphs are equal, uh, created equally. In one graph with multiple metric, a line graph may tell you how individual host latency is doing, but a stack graph may pay, point to a better picture of your overall latency. And also how, how can I quickly see what alarms are triggered in the same view as my operation matrix? So these are all considerations you know, and key takeaways which you have to keep in mind when you're designing uh, the dashboards, when you are selecting the matrix and when you are trying to create a very customized environment for your users so it's most effective for them. So in summary, much of the monitoring in the early stages is intuitive as we have all experience. But as workloads grow in complexity, uh, perspectives sometimes get lost. So before you reach for the console, consider your approach and make a plan, let it guide your efforts. Work backward from the users and derive metrics based on that. Determine different personas that exist and map them to the matrix that is valuable for them. 
matrix for operations user will be different than a customer who is using the application, for example. If you want to measure user experience, then latency is important and not CPU usage, for example. So getting the right metric to the measure is very important. And at the end, just take an iterative approach, start monitoring your platform, your application, and then test it. And that's the best way to move forward with that. So with this, I will let Al take over, and he's going to walk you through how InfluxDB helps in monitoring AWS. Thank you very much, Shashi. That was a great overview. Um, now I'd like to go ahead and talk to you about how to monitor AWS with InfluxDB. And if you look at what we can do with InfluxDB with our time series data platform, it really breaks down to three areas, uh, accumulate, analyze, and act. So let's first look at the accumulate piece in the context of AWS. What, you can, what we can do with AWS is we can, our CloudWatch metric can pull metrics in from any one of the 93 different AWS services that CloudWatch can monitor. Now this is all, many of the services that you, you know and love with AWS, all the popular services like EC2 and RDS and Route 53 and so forth. So there's a lot of stuff that you can get in just with the CloudWatch plugin. And we're gonna show you how to configure this CloudWatch plugin later on um, in this presentation. In addition to that, you can also pull in even more metrics using our ECS or Elastic Container Services plugin for AWS, our Docker plugin uh, for generic Docker. Um, that allows you to pull in metrics from AWS, ECS, and Fargate. We also allow you to pull in metrics from EC2 using um, our system plugin. AWS EKS or Elastic Kubernetes Service through our Kubernetes plugins. You can pull in uh, metrics from Kinesis using our Kinesis plugin. And then if you have AD, uh, IoT devices or sensors, you can pull those in uh, using our MQTT or Modbus plugins to name but a few. Now, also, a lot of times when you're pulling in time series data, you also want to enrich that data with information coming from a relational database. So a classic example might be, uh, you might have time series data that has the uh, customer ID in the time series, but you don't know the name of the customer, you don't know where they're located, you don't know the annual contract value of that customer. Um, and so you want to pull that data in, and that data is typically stored in a relational database. So what we can do is we can use flux joins to pull that data in. And this is using the sql.from flux command. Um, and what you can do is you can use that to pull data in from AWS RDS, which of course has uh, engines for MariaDB, MySQL, and Postgres. So that's how you can enrich your time series data with um, additional metadata that is stored in a relational database running on AWS. So that's the accumulate piece. Now let's go ahead and talk about the analyze piece. And this is sort of the core part of InfluxDB. The accumulate is quite often with Telegraph. The analyze piece is typically with InfluxDB itself. And starting from the bottom up, first of all, um, InfluxDB runs on AWS global infrastructure. So InfluxDB Cloud runs on AWS West 2 in Oregon, as well as EU Central 1 in Frankfurt, Germany. It's also, both of those are uh, uh, integrated with AWS Marketplace Billing. So you can use your, uh, you get combined billing um, on your AWS account for your InfluxDB Cloud charges. In addition to InfluxDB Cloud, you can also run InfluxDB Enterprise, and that runs on dozens of different uh, sites globally on uh, you know, an AWS infrastructure. Now, whether you choose InfluxDB Cloud or InfluxDB Enterprise, you get uh, the following things. You get a purpose-built time series database that can do real-time data stream processing. It has integrated visual, visualization and dashboarding, both ad hoc, uh, queries as well as uh, dashboards that you've set up. Um, we can do a data analysis, anomaly detection, and we have alerting and notification built in. 
The last piece is act. And even though uh, InfluxDB has built in alerting, we also integrate with leading alerting systems um, from PagerDuty, from Slack. We can also uh, integrate with webhooks, so you can reach out to a number of other alerting systems out there. We, can, we also see the fact that uh, InfluxDB shouldn't be a, a one-way street with data. It's important to get data in, but it's also important to be able to pull data out and send data out to other systems that can use it. And so for that reason, we have Telegraph output plugins that can send data out to AWS Kinesis and also out to AWS CloudWatch. So you could be pulling um, data in from a third-party system that has nothing to do with AWS and send it out to CloudWatch if that's something that you desire to do. Also, a number of our customers really love using Grafana for visualization. So we have a first class integration with Grafana. Uh, our engineering team and theirs work very closely together to make sure that integration uh, is as tight as possible. And for developers who are building uh, applications on top of InfluxDB, we have client libraries that run in a wide variety of languages, uh, such as Python, Go, PHP, C Sharp, Java, uh, Node, and so forth. So this allows you to accumulate time series data, to analyze that data, and then to act on it in the appropriate way. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna, we're gonna dive into the Telegraph input plugins. And I'd like to go ahead and mention that all of these input plugins um, are on GitHub. So you, if you go to github.com slash influx data slash Telegraph, you can then um, find those various input plugins. Again, for CloudWatch, ECS, Docker, et cetera. So now I'd like to go ahead and talk about how you can set up your telegraph.conf configuration file specifically to monitor CloudWatch. So again, this allows you to pull in data from 93 different AWS services. We're gonna be focusing here on uh, just a couple of them, EC2, and ELB, or Elastic Load Balancer. So the first thing to keep in mind is the overall agent configuration. Um, and I'll go ahead and walk through each of this, these files, and then we'll show you the complete end-to-end uh, -end, um, configuration file. So the first thing is, what do you want to do around your debug level? Um, in this case, I've set things up for debug equals false, so it's less verbose, but you can certainly set debug equals true for uh, for more verbosity in your output. The next thing is how often do you want to collect metrics? Um, you can collect as frequently as one second or, or even, even more frequently if you need to. But I think for the, for the case of monitoring, you know, you would be down at the, uh, at the, at the second level, nothing uh, lower than that. You can also set this up to, let's say, 1M for one minute, or 5M or 15M for five or 15 minutes. So you have a lot of flexibility there. The next question, the next uh, parameter is around how uh, frequently do you flush uh, metrics for all outputs? Here we have that set up for once every 10 seconds. And then our metric uh, buffer limit. So the more metrics that you're collecting, the higher you want this to be. And this uh, buffer is helpful in case there's a temporary uh, network disturbance and you want to you telegraph to hold on to those metrics uh, for a while in memory before sending them out to uh, InfluxDB itself. So this is uh, part of the overall agent configuration. The next thing to do is to set up, is first to list that you have, that you're basically running the CloudWatch plugin. And so that's pretty straightforward. You just have double bracket sign inputs dot CloudWatch. And then we're gonna go ahead and walk through everything in that CloudWatch section. So here what you do is you specify your AWS region. And what we're doing here is we just have region equals and then the CloudWatch, um, excuse me, the AWS uh, region that you prefer. In this case, we have US West 2. You can see other regions, other popular regions in the Europe and uh, North American areas. And you can find all of these on uh, AWS's documentation page right here. Let's go ahead and take a look at what those look like. Okay, video editor, go ahead and just, I did a little flub there with the back and forth. I guess it's not gonna be possible for me to 
gracefully switch into these different pages uh, like I was planning on doing. So go ahead and just edit out that little section. The next thing to do is to specify your AWS credentials. And um, there's a few different ways you can do this. One way is you can go ahead and specify your access key and your secret key. You could also do things like uh, pull your uh, shared profile. You can pull them in from environment variables. You can have a shared credentials file um, or you can use your EC2 instance profile. In this case, we're choosing option number five, which is the shared credentials file. And so I have a, a file called credentials running in the same directory as my telegraph config. And here's what it looks like. Uh, default AWS access key, AWS secret key. Um, if anyone is, wants to try these at home, don't worry, I've actually munged these so they are not the correct values, but this gives you a sense of what the syntax looks like. The next thing to do is to specify your collection timing. And so uh, this is important to make sure that you are compliant with different um, uh, CloudWatch parameters and restrictions to make sure that, that we're, um, being, uh, we're being polite with CloudWatch and we're not uh, pulling things more than the limits that are allowed in the CloudWatch API. So what we're doing here is we're pulling this in, uh, metrics in once every minute. And this has to be a multiple of 60 seconds, so one minute, two minutes, et cetera. Um, the collection delay, and the delay here is five minutes, so we have a little bit of a lag, again, to be polite with the API. And then we have the uh, interval. And so we make sure that our interval is in a multiple of period. So in this case, our period is one minute, our interval is one minute. This could also be an interval of two minutes, three minutes, whatever. And so what we're doing is we're pulling things in, in one minute intervals once every one minute. Uh, again, you have plenty of flexibility here. The next thing to do is to configure your metric namespaces. And so the key thing here is that um, these are specified by AWS. And so if you go to this page here on Amazon's documentation, you'll find a page called AWS Services CloudWatch Metrics. And you'll see a range of different namespaces for each one corresponding to different AWS services. So you'll see different namespaces for uh, RDS and Route 53 and ELB and EKS and so forth. And so this is essentially directing the CloudWatch plugin to go into the right um, metric namespace. In this case, of course, we're doing EC2. And then what we're doing is we're, we're putting a rate limit for how many metrics do we want to pull per second. In this case, we're saying a rate limit of 25. And we can pull, as you can see here, a maximum of 50 re uh, requests per second. And um, what we're doing here is we're pulling some metrics from EC2. We're also pulling some metrics from ELB. And so each one of those has a rate limit of 25 seconds each, which of course adds up to 50 re requests per second. And so if you look at different AWS services that publish CloudWatch metrics, this is um, from that uh, documentation page I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, you can see here's the namespace for Amazon API Gateway. Simply gateway, AppStream, AppSync, Athena, Billing, and so forth. Again, there's 93 different um, such services that you can pull in. And so the great thing here with CloudWatch is the fact that it does provide metrics from so many parts of the AWS ecosystem. And the great thing about the CloudWatch uh, Telegraph plugin is that it can, it can pull all these metrics in as well. So it really gives you a lot of flexibility uh, to be able to pull these metrics in, into InfluxDB. And then another tip, this is something that um, I like to do whenever I set up um, Telegraph monitoring, is to just add in my own tag specific for a particular plugin. So in this case, what I'm saying is for the uh, CloudWatch input, I like, I want to set up these tags. And um, I go ahead and I say the plugin equals CloudWatch and then the AWS service equals EC2. So we'll see how this is easier to, makes it easier to find my metrics when I'm in the um, Data Explorer in InfluxDB to be able to find stuff uh, more quickly. And of course, you can set up whatever name value pairs you want here according to um, your own preferences and needs. 
The next thing you need to do is to specify the metrics that you want Telegraph to pull in. And so again, what we have here, double bracket inputs.cloudwatch.metrics. And you can see all the EC2 metrics available here in this uh, documentation page. Now, each uh, AWS service is going to have their own list of metrics available. So these are the ones that we're pulling in. Now, there's actually even more metrics that we could pull in from, uh, from CloudWatch for EC2. But we're sticking with these. And I think this is a pretty good initial list. But again, go to the documentation page, pull in the metrics that you feel you want to have, and um, add them here to your, your names. Um, notice that everything is bracket, double quote, comma, and uh, the, the file format here is very um, accommodating towards line breaks and, and other white space. So um, you can put it on multiple lines to make it a bit more readable, as I've done here. And so if you want to find the list of metrics for each AWS service, the best thing, at least that I've found to do, is just to Google list of CloudWatch metrics for, and then whatever um, AWS service you're interested in. So in this case, we're looking up RDS, and you can see Amazon's provided a nice table here that shows up in an answer panel on Google, and um, you can go ahead and drill in. And so basically, each one of these metric names is what we would have in that list that we saw previously. Now, we're talking about uh, the next thing we need to do is to specify your instance that you want to pull. Now, this is going to vary uh, for your own AWS instances. In this case, we have an instance ID. Um, so name equals instance ID, value equals this GUID that you see here. And uh, of course, this will be different for your installation. So don't use our um, instance name for, for you because that obviously won't be pulling you pulling out useful information for you. Um, another best practice, and this is sort of stepping outside of, of AWS monitoring, but I find it really helpful to have Telegraph to monitor itself. And the reason is, is that if you're pulling in too many metrics or metrics are getting dropped or you're getting errors, um, it's really handy to have these Telegraph metrics already in, in FlexDB so you can troubleshoot any, uh, any errors that you might find. So to do that, it's really straightforward double bracket inputs.internal, uh, collect memory stats equals true. That's a good thing to do. And then again, I like to set up my own tags, inputs.internal. And again, this is internal is referring to the internal telegraph plugin dot tags. And I just say plugins equals internal. I like to have this plugins name so I kind of know what metrics are coming from which telegraph plugin. So just handy. Um, housekeeping there to uh, keep all your metrics straight. Now we've, so we've been talking about what we're pulling in as inputs. Now let's go ahead and talk about what we want to send out as outputs. So in this case, um, we're sending to, unsurprisingly, um, InfluxDB uh, version two. So InfluxDB Cloud, it uses the InfluxDB version two Telegraph output plugin. So again, double bracket, outputs dot, InfluxDB underscore V2 double bracket. Okay. Um, the first thing you want to do is to specify your InfluxDB cloud instance. You can find these, these uh, URLs on, uh, on this page here in the documentation v2.docs.influxdata, et cetera. And in this case, we want to send stuff to our US West 2. Uh, but again, you can find the complete list of Cloud2 URLs that are, uh, that are available on that documentation page. And if you're writing to InfluxDB open source, um, if you're doing it for, um, for V2, you're going to be writing it to localhost colon uh, 9999. So it's port 9999. And for version 1, you'd be writing to, I believe it's port 8086. Okay, so, so a couple little key things to keep in mind there. Um, what I like to do is I like to put my access token into an environment variable, so that way I can share my um, I can share my uh, uh, you know Telegraph configuration files without giving away my uh, access tokens. That's a really handy thing to do. Another tip that I find useful as a practitioner is to have um, a token that allows me to read and write to all buckets. Um, now this is handy, this strikes a nice balance between convenience 
and security. I don't want to have an all access token that can do, um, that can do uh, you know, administration on my database, but I find it really handy to have a bucket, to have one token that can read and write to all buckets. Um, works well from a development perspective. Obviously for production uh, perspective, you'd probably want to have uh, least privileged enforce more and have your tokens uh, only for reading and or writing to a particular bucket. But for a development case, read and write to all is, is, a, is a handy way to go. Um, so we have a, I've just done an export to a variable called a system environment variable called US West underscore two one. And we're referencing it right here in quotes, dollar sign to get the value. The next thing is your organization. And that's simply the email that you signed up with. Um, if you're in single user mode, um, if you're multi-user mode, you would uh, you'd use the uh, organization that has been set by the, by the person who administers your database. My bucket name, I just keep things simple and call it AWS. Um, this is case sensitive, so um, I always like to go with lowercase for my bucket names. And then another tip that um, it's not really heavily uh, exposed through the documentation, but in our benchmarks, we found this to be about five times faster uh, in transmitting the data is to set content encoding to uh, gzip. And so um, that'll send things over quicker and uh, so you'll have a faster ingest rate. Now you can also dual write to multiple instances. So in that same Telegraph configuration file, we have a second section, outputs.influxdb v2. And this is going to our EU central uh, cloud two instance based in Frankfurt. Why would we want to do this? Well, we'd want to do this because if, we, if we're monitoring, um, it's sometimes handy if there is an outage and it doesn't happen often, but if there is a big outage, um, it's handy to have your monitoring metrics in two geographically separate locations. Um, so that you can have the data that you need to troubleshoot quickly. Um, so again, this is using a, our, a different uh, Cloud2 URL, the EU Central one in Frankfurt. Um, my token, I've just chosen to call the environment variable EU Central 1.1, so that way um, I can distinguish it. Um, and that's, again, stored in my uh, environment variable. We see that the, uh, the email I sent, signed up with is, um, Again, my own email, and I just put in a plus EU central one to distinguish uh, this account from my, my default one. Uh, and then the same thing, I have a bucket on there called AWS and I'm sending stuff over with gzip so it's quicker. So dual write is a good thing there. Another little tip is to, for troubleshooting, is to write your outputs to, a, um, to just standard out. So that way you can see the line protocol uh, data coming out. It's handy to do when, you, when you're first running things, you wanna make sure everything works well, it gives you a little bit quicker feedback uh, than if you're writing stuff to the database. So that's another little tip for um, quickly debugging, troubleshooting, confirming that everything is going well. So with that, let's go ahead and show you a demo. So here is the file that we just looked at, um, cloudwatch.telegraph.config. This is also uh, up on my GitHub um, repo that I'll show you towards the end of this so you can have access to the, uh, the code itself that you need. So we see the agent config section. We see our telegraph inputs, our different regions. You can just uncomment these or look up your own. We see our different AWS credentials. Again, I'm, I'm pulling them from this credentials file. We see our um, CloudWatch aggregation period. We see our uh, different uh, namespaces that we looked at earlier, the metrics we're pulling down, um, our instance ID. We see, um, now this is a second section we didn't look at in the PowerPoint, but what we have here is we're pulling stuff in from ELB, Elastic Load Balancer. So again, same region, same credentials file, um, same period, we have a little bit longer delay. The namespace in this case is ELB as opposed to EC2. And then I like to, the plugin is our CloudWatch plugin. And in this case, I've changed the tag here to ELB. Again, it just makes easier housekeeping. Here's where we have our internal telegraph monitoring. 
Okay, so this is all the inputs that we've done. Now let's talk about telegraph outputs. Here we're outputting to um, US West 1 that we saw earlier in PowerPoint. Here we have output to um, EU Central 1 in Frankfurt. And then here we have our outputs. And you know, the first time I run this, the outputs is handy. Soon after, I'd want to comment this by putting a pound sign um, or hash sign to the left of each line. But for the first one, it's handy to have. Okay, so that is our telegraph config file. Now let's go ahead to the terminal. So how do we run this? So if we go to telegraph config cloudwatch.telegraph.conf, we hit return. We see that we've loaded our, we've loaded uh, three inputs, um, our two on the CloudWatch side and one on the internal for monitoring Telegraph itself. We're writing to, um, we don't have any aggregators or processors and we are writing to output file and to uh, influx db v2. And we can see our interval is 30 seconds. We're not quiet, my host name. And what we see here is this is the line protocol that we're writing here. So these are actual time series that are being sent over. And a lot's going to be coming out. And that's, again, because we're writing everything to standard out. Um, so we can see that things are working well. So now let's go ahead into InfluxDB itself. So we have here a range of buckets. In this case, we're talking about AWS. And we can see here in Data Explorer a range of different uh, things that we can choose. I'm Again, I like to sort of do my um, plugin. And so I can, it's just a handy way to, to make sure that we're pulling in which stuff we're pulling in to very quickly narrow things down. In this case, I'm going to go, so we're pulling stuff in from the CloudWatch plugin. And then I want to pull in um, AWS service. So we'll go ahead and look at EC2. Again, these are my, my custom tags that I put in. And now I can go ahead and look at the different types of metrics that we can pull in. So in this case, um, I want to, if I want to go ahead and look at, let's say, the failed average, hit submit. And we can see here that so far we have no failures. I'm going to go ahead and expand my range here a little bit because um, I did have this running overnight so we could have some more interesting data. Um, and if I want to go ahead and look for different measurements, um, I can go ahead and do that. Let's look at ELB. Okay, so let's go ahead and so we can go ahead and play with this and see which different types of um, information I want to go ahead and pull in. Um, so in this case, we're pulling in from US West. And there we go. So um, We can see we can pull things in from our different instance IDs. And here we have a wide range of different services here. So if I want to look at CPU utilization average, let's say, let's hit submit on there. And we can see our different CPU utilization um, for our EC2 instance. And so you can see it's you know, generally zero, but it goes up at certain different points. Um, it's also handy. I, I always find it really handy to have min, max, and average as well, so we can kind of see different spikes. Um, and then, of course, we can drop into the script editor, and we have complete visibility and complete uh, capability to different to do different types of uh, of analyses on there. Uh, for instance, we can do one thing that people uh, might want to do is to do whole winters for forecasting. Um, another thing pe that sometimes works well is to do aggregate window to be able to sort of um, uh, 
make the data um, bucket it by window and, and smooth out. And this is really handy if you have very bouncy data that's going up and down to eliminate what I call the uh, fuzzy caterpillar type of mode. In any case, once we have this, we can go ahead and save this as a dashboard. And so we'll go ahead and in this case, I'm going to create a new dashboard. Name the dashboard, we'll call this AWS CloudWatch. And we'll call this uh, CPU, EC2 CPU. Save as a dashboard cell. Dashboard has been created successfully. Now we'll go to my dashboards, AWS CloudWatch. And here's my um, EC2 CPU. I can go ahead and stretch that out a little bit. And we can go ahead and if we want, we can configure it. We can make the time frame the past 12 hours so we can see more data. Um, and we have a, a range of different types of customization, um, visual customization, the y-axis, the color scheme, interpolation, smooth is sometimes kind of handy to see. And there you go. And from there, of course, we can go ahead and add in, if I wanted to add in a new cell, um, I would have the, uh, the same kind of um, uh, query, visual query capability that I, that I had before. And I can also go into the script editor as well. So we make it really easy for you to build out these dashboards. Um, and then of course you can build out tasks and alerts and, and so forth. So that's a, just a quick snapshot of the um, dashboard creation and, and ad hoc querying in InfluxDB for uh, AWS CloudWatch metrics. So all of this is available um, on my GitHub. Uh, github.com slash alsargent slash telegraph cloudwatch. And one of the things that um, we mentioned, of course, is the fact that InfluxDB Cloud and InfluxDB Enterprise runs on AWS and are integrated with AWS Marketplace Billing. And again, you might be asking yourself, well, which one should I choose? Well, InfluxDB Cloud is fully managed, it's serverless, it auto scales. Um, our site reliability engineering team monitors this and maintains it 24-7, 365, so that you don't have to. Um, this is really significant because we've had customers tell us that this can save them about, depends on their installation size, but this can save them about half an FTE, half a full-time equivalent employee uh, in terms of administration time. And so if you think about that in terms of you know, what, does, what do your system administrators cost um, in terms of salary benefits, et cetera, that can be some pretty significant time savings and money savings and budget savings that you get with InfluxDB Cloud. With InfluxDB Enterprise, you um, do more maintenance on your own, but you can run it on many different uh, AWS regions. Essentially, just about every AWS region, except the China regions, and the US government regions you can run on. Um, whereas InfluxDB Cloud currently is only on two AWS regions in Oregon and Frankfurt, Germany. In either case, both of them are, as I mentioned, on AWS Marketplace Billing, so you can pay for your InfluxDB charges uh, with your AWS account and um, apply any kind of credits you have or any uh, prepaid uh, commits, apply those to uh, InfluxDB as well. So, and if you want um, to, if you're thinking about running InfluxDB on AWS, you are in very good company. We have a number of customers who run uh, InfluxDB on AWS, Capital One, Yieldsoft, which is part of Salesforce, Houghton Mifflin, Robinhood, Coupa, and Comcast, to name but a few. If you want to get uh, InfluxDB Cloud, the best thing to do is to go to AWS Marketplace, type in a search for Inf InfluxDB Cloud, and the first uh, hit will be InfluxDB Cloud. You can click the link and go in there to instantly sign up. And then if you want InfluxDB Enterprise, then the thing to do there, again, AWS Marketplace, type in InfluxDB Enterprise, and again, your result there will be InfluxDB Enterprise. You can spin up an instance right away, 
and get to work on um, all of the different things that you saw in this demo and video. So I'd like to thank my co-presenter Shashi for your excellent presentation on how to monitor AWS and best practices. And I hope that uh, this has been helpful for you in getting started in monitoring um, AWS using InfluxDB. Thanks a lot, everybody.